Hey guys, OG Albini here, bringing you guys another Draft League replay analysis. If you guys missed the first, you know, video, I guess, in this series that we threw up um, sometime last week, week and a half ago, something like that. It's basically a series where I have a Google form and I'll link in the description below. Please submit your replays. Um, if you want to submit a replay to me, I have 17 to work with already, though. You'll submit a replay with me, your polka paste and your matchup and any rules you may have, your name and all that stuff. And what I'll do is I'll go through, I'll analyze your matchup, your build, and your play um now it might not be an hour-long video but I'll, I'll analyze them pretty deep i definitely do my research and like you know do all these stuff beforehand and um i'll kind of let you know where you went wrong what you could have done better and what you did well in the game and things like that now of course i, I do want to mention this isn't to dunk on anybody obviously these replays are willingly submitted and i'm not here to um you know dunk on anybody in their play it's just an opportunity to get better i'm not the greatest player in the world but I think I am pretty good, and I think I have been playing this game for a pretty long while, that I can kind of notice, um, not necessarily obvious, but um, I can notice a lot of things that, you know, in the moment, as you're playing, you might not have noticed. So, um, this is never meant to, you know, you know, make fun of anybody for losing their games. Also, if you submit new replays, please don't submit you smashing people or getting smashed. It's not really going to be super productive. These are more so actually for close games. And last week's game with Bruno7 was a really, really close game and a really good game. It literally came down to one turn where he could have made... Um, a little bit more of an optimal play and he would have secured a victory. So it's going to be something like that. If you guys do enjoy this video and the series, please let me know in the comments below. Drop a like, sub to the channel. We're on our way to 2,000. We're almost at 1.7k, so we are absolutely climbing. I'd really appreciate if it helps get to 2,000. I want to get to 3,000 by the end of the year, so if you help me out, I would appreciate it. Okay, that being said, we can go into the matchup. It's actually going to be um, our boy Oliver, um, poor boys, who's a big friend of the channel. He helps out in our front office all the time, which you can join in the description below as well. Um, he's an APA guy. I've played him myself a few times. He's been around the block for a while. He's a great guy, solid player, really, really cool dude. He wanted me to analyze. I think this is BPL um, week one where he's going up against someone named, um, what's their name? Furf Apple. So I, I don't know his opponent, obviously, but um, this is going to be a Generation 9 league. So this is the first time we had to look at a Generation 9 matchup. We did a Gen 8 matchup last time, um, and it'll definitely be a lot of fun to kind of see, you know, um, you know how this Terra, this Terra format and things like that ends up working out. They have a pretty interesting one here. So we're going to go over the matchup first. You see that the Terra rule in this league is pretty interesting. Every single Pokemon has a designated Terra type assigned to them post draft that, you know, the coach is going to end up picking. Now, this also means that everything can Terra, though. So, you know what every Pokemon can Terra into, but they all can Terra, which leads to a lot of mind games and a lot of 50-50s. I'm not 100% sure on how I feel about every Pokemon being able to Terra. It seems incredibly overwhelming in a counter-team format, um, but it's at least interesting to try and, like, you know, analyze a game like this, because I haven't played any leagues with, a you know, a rule set like this yet. So, it would definitely be really interesting. So, Oliver's team is on the left side. The, the far left side of the screen, um, and he has the Roaring Moon, Iron Moth, Slitherwing, Torkoal, Gastron, Cyclozar, Klefki, Bronzog, Miss Magius, Venomoth, Frostmoth, the Moth Core, um, and Leafy. Oh my gosh, he has Quadruple Moth, by the way. I would like everybody to know he has four Moths. <laughs> moth, Iron Moth, Sl uh, Slitherwing, Venomoth, and Frostmoth, while his opponent's team is on the right side of the screen, and it consists of Dragonite, Skeledurge, Lycanroc Dusk, Sandy Shocks, Barraskewda, Screamtail, Iron Jugulus, Toadscrool, Tauros Peldea Aqua, which is water, Delayed, Grafite Eye, and Magnezone. I feel like there's 73 Pokemon each of these teams. Um, we can kind of talk about the matchup in general. From Oliver's side, I think Banded Roaring Moon looks incredible into um, his opponent's team. If you look at the squad he's rolling out with, he really doesn't appreciate it all too much. He doesn't actually have great reliable dark resist. Um, on his squad and I think that it can really really end up kind of hurting him um, in the long run if he can get up hazards and chip things down with u-turns like a banded crunch um, or even a banded out or a banded dragon claw or outrage endgame is very very viable and very very possible so I think banded crunch especially in the sun if he ends up bringing it is really nice speaking of sun that iron moth looks incredible under the sun there's not much that switches into that guy at all even something like skeletridge doesn't have like as beefy of a spadef set as it does fizz def um so if you end up getting up the sun your terra fire you end up just clicking fiery dance overheat flamethrower whatever it might be 
Nothing really wants to switch into it. He has Dragonite as resist, but one, you get Gleam if he's not tearing. And two, if he tears, you don't resist fire no more, right? Um, and then you have, what, two very offensive waters, um, which are really going to get blown up, honestly. I think Bear Scooter probably dies in the sun. Tauros, Paldea, Aqua. Uh, it might not die, but it's going to put it in range with like a 2 hit KO from Mence after Hazard, or Roaring Moon after Hazard. So I think that's a really, really incredible option that Oliver can go for in this week. Whether it just be boots, um, or whether it be specs or something of the sorts, I think it could be incredible in this matchup. Sun, in general, like we said, just looks good. You're into two waters, but the waters aren't the bulkiest things in the world. Now, Taurus Paldea is probably going to be pretty bulky in this game. It's probably going to be the moon check, maybe like an Intim Rocky Helmet set or something of the sorts. Um, but regardless, uh, you can really overwhelm it with sun offense. Things like Roaring Moon under the sun. Things like Iron Moth under the sun. Things like Slitherwing under the sun. Um, even your own Torkoal, if he's like, man, I don't have a Lava Plume switch in, I can't let anything get burned um and skeletors is down or terrid or you know is in range or is in range of earth power something of the sorts you can really put on a lot of offensive pressure with your son and really 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 put the hurt down your opponent's team now as for his opponent's team there's some really scary threats on it right we have the dragonite which looks very very scary after a dragon dance whether it um if it chooses to terra normal like a terra normal dragon dance e-speed Fire Punch, and then either EQ or Roost, probably EQ, looks pretty insane into this matchup if that Torkoal can be chipped down and dealt with. Now, um, the reason I say Fire Punch EQ is obviously Bronzong's levitating things of the sorts. Now, Bronzong can, you know, go ahead and Terra Poison, which is nice, but then you're kind of burning your Terra option in order to check that Dragonite, which is going to be really, really clutch for your opponent, in all honesty. So that's a really big aspect we have to keep in mind. Um, another Pokemon that can really spiral is that Dirge, especially if it elects to Terra. Terra Fairy Dirge looks menacing versus this team. It allows it to check Moon. Um, it allows it to check the Slitherwing still, which it already kind of did, but really allows it to check the Moon. Um, and it's going to be really tough to switch into. Like a will o Hex Torch Song Slack Offset looks absolutely demonic into a team like this. Um, it really, really compounds and just goes really, just goes crazy over the course of the game. And it can be really, really obnoxious for Oliver to deal with over the course of this one. So that's really scary. Another big threat is actually the Iron Jugulus. I think this Pokemon is very slept on in the draft format right now, and it looks pretty incredible into this team. There's not much that switches into this guy. He does get Flamethrower um, in order to hit things like Keys, Dark Pulse for Zong, um, which obviously is a flying resist, and then everything else kind of gets rocked by a Hurricane or um, anything of the sorts. I think it also gets Earth Power. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it gets Earth Power, which can blow up Torkoal, which it could be a you know potential Hurricane deterrent or something of the sorts. It's very annoying for this team. I think that if that thing is positioned correctly, it could really blow up Oliver's team, and he has to be super careful about it. I think it's actually incredible into the squad. Um, in general, I think this is going to be a very offensive matchup. There's plenty of other Pokemon that I haven't mentioned that have the potential to really run away with this game i think it's a little bit leaning towards oliver's opponent when it comes to the offense matchup dragonite skelders lichen rock dust sandy shocks um not really bear skeeter jugulus um even things like galade don't have good switches even things like magnazar if they come in and they trap that bronzong it can be really really obnoxious for him so there's a lot of really scary things that oliver has to deal with throughout the game <coughs> now that being said let's go ahead and take a look at his build so you can see, I'm going to have to, like, drag around the dimensions for this guy a bunch throughout this vid. I don't really have, like, a super high-tech setup set for it right now. But, um, yeah. Now, jumping into the build, we, I see that he saw the same thing that I saw. Band Moon looks really, really good. And this coverage in particular looks really, really good. Earthquake, Crunch, Dragon Claw, and U-Turn. I'm going to be bouncing between these guys. Um, Earthquake to, you know, nuke things like Magnezone. It's a good strong neutral move on something like Tauros. It blows up the Sandy Shocks in one, which is nice. And again, it's a nice neutral middle ground uh, click on things like Skeledurge. You have the Dragon Claw for the Scarf Dragon Stab, which can be really, really solid into things like Jugulus, uh, which isn't a dragon, but it hits it very hard is more so what I mean. A non terra Dragonite to, you know, not lose a 50-50 or whatever it might be. I don't know. Um, and really things like that, which is going to be really clutch. And then U-Turn Crunch is going to be what you're clicking 99% of the time, which is really nice. Then, as for the Miss Magius, I actually like Scarf Miss Magius. I think this is a really good revenge-killing tool in this matchup. It actually outspeeds, like, the entirety of his team outside of Bear Skewda Iron Jugulus, which is really, really nice. The only issue is I'm not too sure, um, on the Trick Slot. I think I would have loved to see either Destiny Bond or Will-O-Wisp on this guy, especially being that it's a normal immunity. It's something that can come hard in 
on the Dragonite and Scarf with a Wispet. Um, and really burn it and neuter it, which it's a huge, huge threat to your team right now. I think that would have been incredibly clutch for you to have that option to burn the D-Knight so that it's not chipping down the rest of your team. Then we have Bronzong, which is a really interesting set here. We have Toxic Orb, Terra Poison, it's Trick, Gyro Ball, Body Press, and Iron Spinner. Um, it's serious nature. I talked to him about this. I asked to make sure, like, so I didn't, like, dunk on him in the middle of the video. This was an accident. It was supposed to be, um, probably Brave, I or not Brave, Relaxed, I presume, um, which makes sense. Now... The, the trick set is very, very interesting, right? Um, it's a good alternative to Toxic, uh, and it can really help out with catching things like Dirge or D-Knight and cripple them and poison them, um, as well as take their items away. Taking away the boots from either of those Pokemon is incredible. So I think this is a really, really innovative prep. Garrow Ball, Body Press, and Ice Spinner are both great options as well. Terra Poison does come up pretty clutch here, allowing it to avoid that Fire Punch weakness from the Dragonite. Um, but again, it can still get pretty out of hand. He has Ice Spinner plus Body Press to be able to hit it, whether it tears or not, which is also really nice. Then we have a Rocky Helmet Gastron. Um, this is going to be a really clutch member of the team this week. It's going to be great for checking that Lycanroc Dusk, which is looking to be a bigger and bigger problem as we go through this team builder. Anything that can kind of take on Dragonite um, is kind of forced to take on the Dragonite and then be put in range of Lycanroc Dusk. So I think that Gastron is going to be incredibly important and in keeping that thing at bay, keeping you from losing to Bandit Cell Rock or Life Orb Cell Rock or whatever it may be. Uh, the Helmet's going to come up really clutch in a close combat and things of the sort as well. And if you can keep it healthy... Um, and sustained throughout the game. It's going to be nice. Uh, obviously, uh, this is a good spin or a good rocker as well. Earth Power Ice Beam hits most things pretty darn hard, which is also nice. Then we have Torkoal. It is actually just a four attack set. It's Love Plume. Ice, or Rev is bitter, Earth Power, and Clear Smog. Clear Smog is a cool tech for any setup that you may have, and things like Dragonite, so you're not super shut up bait for it, unless it's a substitute variant. Um, even like something like a Skeletor, if it really starts compounding or anything like that. Um, or even a Screamtail, if it's Calm Mind and really wants to try and overwhelm you with its uh, ridiculous bulk or something of the sorts. Other than that, pretty simple stuff. Rapid Spin is going to be great in all these hazards. The Lycan Rock, the Sandy Shots especially, the Toad's Cruel, um, and things of the sort. So Rapid Spin is pretty needed here, I understand that. You do kind of lose to a lot of the rockers defensively or a lot of the rockers and spikers defensively but it's definitely not something that you you know can't overcome and then we do have the choice specs solarona sorry and i like calling it that i think that's the race nickname for it i think it's perfect but we do see a pretty cool set here and you turn fire dance sludge wave and toxic spikes terrifier as we saw t spikes is a cool uh, pretty cool little option here especially if that grafi eye oops i didn't mean to zoom in especially if that grafi eye doesn't end up coming a t spike can be great um, for a majority of this team, if you do end up, you know, finding the position to set it up, especially if you know, like, Dirge is coming in or whatever the very, you know, telegraph switching is, you get up that T-Spike, you're in a good spot later on. Fiery Dance can compound. You might miss out on the power of, like, a Specs Overheat or even a Specs Flamethrower, just that 10 base power more. Could really, you know, end up being clutch, but again, it's not the end of the world. It's not the biggest deal in the world, so... Um, yeah, I think the build overall is pretty darn solid. Um, my biggest worries, like I said, include that D Dance, D Knight, and that Terra Fairy Surge, uh, that Terra Fairy Dirge, including that Lycan Rock Dust, which is really looking to be scary into this team. You really have, um, I want to say two, but really it is one if you elect to dedicate that Bronzong to the D Knight. And if you're forced into a more defensive Terra option, um, it might end up hurting you in the long run. So we're going to have to see how this ends up going. All right. We are to the game. I'm going to make it nice and big, so you guys got to bear with me for a second. Just so we can see everything. Once again, like in my Smog Tour video, um, the Taurus Paldea sprite just isn't showing up on the screen for some reason. So, that's for Taurus Paldea Aqua. You see what he brought. He brought Sandy Shocks, Tauros, Lycanroc Dusk, Gallade, Skeledurge, and Dragonite. So, lots and lots of offense that can be really, really scary for this team. Again, that physical offense core of D-Knight. Plus, the Lycanroc is scary. Hazard support from that Sandy Shocks, as well as a good breaker into this matchup. Honestly, like, Gastro, it, it's a really weird mod. It reminds me of, like, things like Quag, where, like, if you're Fizz Def, you take physical hits. And it's very hard to kill you without a super effective move. But, but, if you do that, then you're not taking special hits. And vice versa, just due to their high HP stats and how EVs end up working out and things like that. So... Being that this Gastro is Fizz Def, it was, if it was Spadef, um, Shocks probably wouldn't be a, too big of an issue, but you get caught with an Earth Power, you're basically to a kill, which is really, really scary for, uh, you know, Core Voices team here, considering that the Gastro and Bronzong core is really, really important in this game. Okay, that being said, we can go ahead and jump on into this guy right here. Sorry, let me move my notes. Awesome. So, we have a Gastron lead into a Sandy Shocks lead. This is honestly a great lead 
for Oliver right here. It's going to allow him a pretty free rocks. Um, his opponent makes a very aggressive play in staying in themselves um, and getting up their own rocks. But these rocks are going to be incredibly important throughout this game um, to, uh, you know, ship things down, especially if he ends up getting a trick on either the Dirge or the D-Knight, um, shipping down the Tauros on Switch, and even if it's just that little bit, it's great, breaking a Sash on, like, an SD Lycanroc, things of those sorts. I will say, this is a bit scary, right? Because you think, oh man, I force out this thing, I'm in a good spot. But if I'm Oliver's opponent, I'm kind of realizing, like, okay, I lived that Earth Power, right? Because Gastro's not that strong, obviously. I live that Earth Power, and I either rock up as he rocks up, or he Earth Powers me, and I get my rocks up. Then that next turn, if he wants to go for a KO, I can get my damage with Earth Power. Scout and see what kind of set he is. If he's Spud Def, then my Lycanroc and my, uh, what do you call it, D-Knight don't have to worry, right? Um, or they don't have to worry as much. And if it's Fizz Def, they're in range. Or this thing's damn near in range at that point. So I think it's a very fair, it was an aggressive play, like I said, turn one. But I don't think it was a bad play from his opponent to stay in there, despite obviously the negative tight matchup and definitely not being able to 1v1 this thing necessarily um, if Oliver just attacked him right there. So um, that's pretty unfortunate. Oliver just has to recognize that this Gastrodon is very important throughout this game as he is going to go ahead and click the Earth Power. And you see, again, that's what I'm saying. Gastro is a bulky Pokemon, but if you're not Spadef, you're not taking special hits, especially from a Life Orb Shandy Shocks. So that's going to do an incredible, incredible amount of damage. Oliver is going to go ahead and get an Earth Power off himself. Um, which does bring this thing down to 16%, which I believe means that rocks plus life orb might kill it, depending on what 16% that is. Um, it might live on like 1 or 2 HP or something of the sort, um, but it definitely doesn't live very much. But it does KO this Gastron right here, which is, again, really, really scary right here. Um, this this Gastro is in a really, really tough spot going forward. So we're going to go ahead and click forward. His opponent actually likes to switch, though. And... This, this kind of baffled me a little bit. If you look at this team and you look at the resist, they don't really exist. I'm getting my value out of the Sandy Shocks now. If he goes Bronze on, even better because your D Knight check, your one other Lycanroc check potentially, now has to take a, like a Life Orb Thunderbolt or even a Life Orb Discharge. It's going to take unrecoverable damage, especially, I mean, he doesn't know that set's not leftovers, but there's no way to keep that Bronzong healthy other than resting, which is also good information to know and something that's exploitable with something like Skeleturge, and you know that its move flow is probably rest talk, and it only has two moves that it can click and things like that. So it becomes a lot more manageable for um, his opponent here, what, Furf Apple, sorry, I totally forgot his name. So I'm not too sure why he switched out there. Even if he was predicting a switch, um, I don't know. Maybe he went into it expecting the Miss Magius coming in, uh, but Miss Magius isn't necessarily the biggest problem right here. Now, Scarf Ghost move does look pretty incredible, especially because that Dragonite hasn't teared. Um, but I don't think it's nothing that you couldn't have handled. Um, I don't know. It's very interesting. I probably would have just stayed and attacked at that point. Um, I can save it later. I can sack to gain a little bit of information. I don't want this Gastron recovering up, though. And you're going to see that's what Oliver elects to do right here. He recovers up, gets back up to 91. You're like, oh, man, we are perfect. We are completely set. We're in a good spot, right? Well, <laughs> you're going to see right here. Obviously, this Glade... It, it, if it's not Leaf Blading, it doesn't kill. But one, it, it can be Leaf Blade. Obviously, you're playing in the Gastro matchup, and your opponent should recognize, man, I really don't deal with this thing very well. Um, or my, my win cons don't deal with this thing very well. But I'm in a position where I can force damage on it, force it out, things like that. Um, but two, even if you are just like Shark and Sacred Sword, we saw that this is Spadef. It doesn't take two of them. It doesn't take it well. Oliver's going to make the mistake, though. He is going to stay in to try and get some damage off here. I know he doesn't have great switch-ins to the Sacred Sword. His Miss Magius is a very risky switch. Everything else kind of gets blown up, and that's really scary. But I don't think that you can afford to take chip on this Gastron when you have the Lycanroc and the Dragonite in the back as really your only deterrence to um, Life Orb and Band to Cell Rock and, um, you know, D-Dance E-Speed after your Bronzong, like, you know, ends up going down or something of the sorts. Um, it puts a lot of pressure on your Bronzong. It's really putting you in a bad spot defensively. And you don't have the same offensive matchup that he has. It's still good, right? Like, you can still write through. Again, like we said, Miss Mag looks great. Um, Iron Moth looks great. The uh, Roaring Moon looks incredible as well. But there are stop gaps to them, and there's not really stop gaps to the Lycanroc now, which is really scary. He is just going to elect to Earth Power. He doesn't recover to Scout, which wouldn't have been a great play, but it wouldn't have been, you know, as bad as Earth Power here. Because one, it also doesn't do much to Glade with its crazy Spadef, and now we, we just don't have options anymore. And we end up sacking off the Gastron incredibly early. It does take that helmet, and it's very low, but... It means that we can get out in our Miss Magius and, you know, do some work right here. As we do see the Sandy Shock sack, and again, this is a good sack right here. Understanding it doesn't really get an opportunity to come back in. Um, 
outside of potentially on the Torkoal or something like that, um, maybe trying to rapid spin or, you know, on a double end on the Torkoal, but again, everything else is much more important. Um, that Glade is still very strong into this team. It's one, like, Night Slash or, you know, some coverage move of the sorts away from blowing up this Mismag, and then there's not really a fighting resist on this team. Um, Iron Moth doesn't really count. Um, I, I've too it killed that thing with close combat, sorry. I think it was, like, Heracross CC, and I'm pretty sure Glade is up there in that power, or, and that's not even Gust Boosted. I'm pretty sure Glade's up there in that power are very, you know, similar to it, so... Very, um, very, very tough, you know, turn of events for uh, Oliver right here. He's, he's not in a great spot when it comes to this endgame. And, um, it's not something you really think of in the moment. At the moment, you're like, okay, I've chipped down the Glade. I killed the Shocks. He's only killed one of my mods. I'm okay right now. Which, in this immediate moment, he doesn't lose the game. Which is good, right? Now, this next turn, Glade is going to come back. Kind of telegraphing that it is a Scarf variant. But even then, um... It's, it's in range of a Shadow Ball, obviously, and it's not faster. I suppose Oliver was kind of scouting for, like, the potential Shadow Sneak or something of the sorts, which I'd be very surprised if it killed. Um, so I, I suppose that's kind of what he's telegraphing right here, but we're going to see his opponent makes a very interesting play and in just going for the Night Slash. I don't know if it's a hard read expecting him to switch, but I don't think it is because we probably would have seen a better move into the uh, Torkoal. It means that he's Scarf and he just kind of wasn't scouting for Scarf Mismag, which is really unfortunate because Oliver ends up taking a lot of, you know, chip right here. Now, I think he made the correct play, right? He, he scouted for Sneak. If he died to Sneak there, he needed to be safe and switch around it. Um, but he ended up clicking Night Slash right here, which was very, very interesting. Um, I'm surprised he didn't go D-Knight there and just kind of position himself to really start clicking buttons and Dragon Dancing up and being annoying, right? Now, Dirge is going to come out here. Oliver's going to make a very good play in Earth Powering. As tempting as it is to try and get away those rocks for your Moth, for your Moon, all this chip damage is going to rack up to make you lose to that priority in the end game. Um, Dirge is just going to absolutely stuff this thing when it comes to trying to spin. These rocks are up for the rest of the game unless he can find a way to goad his opponent into sacking his Skeledirge. But really, there's no reason to. It beats bottom three, loses to Miss Mag um, Moon, and just always oh, switches on them. It shouldn't even tear this game. I think that the ghost typing is perfect here. Um, and we can save that terror for the D-Knight. Now, Earth Power does do a decent chunk, but this thing is really, really low right here. Um, and it's not looking too good for him. He's going to Earth Power, bring him really low. Um, but if his opponent's smart, all he has to do is just spam Slack off, get to a somewhat comfortable point, And he can always find a position to, um, you know, roost up on a Bronzong or um, Slack off up on an Iron Moth or something of the sorts because he looks... He, I mean, I'm assuming he's probably pretty sure deaf. I haven't really run the Calcs or anything like that. But we do kind of see these Earth Powers popping right here. Um, he's also stalling out Sun Turns and things of the sort in case, you know, Oliver wants to, um, you know, pivot out right here and, um, you know, get into his moon after his, you know, what do you call it, dies, and do a lot more damage with a Sun Boosted Crunch with the Protosynthesis opposed to without. Um, he clicks Clear Smog here, which is a really, really interesting turn. Um, I don't necessarily think it's the worst thing in the world, but I think if you're reserved to sacking this thing off, there's no reason to not spam earth power absolutely spam earth power if the d knight comes in you clear smog it to stop it from ddng breaking its multi-skill all that good stuff right i think that's completely fair um i don't know if it makes sense right here because now this dirge is completely nice happy and healthy and it's going to be an absolute nuisance um going forward potentially as it is at 83 and um he's gonna switch out into the roaring moon right here um probably taking a pretty strong uh torch oh he takes the earth power which is another really interesting click he didn't really need to click the earth power there maybe if he didn't have shadow ball i guess shadow ball was free as you the shadow ball or torch song were likely to come out and even then earth power kind of bounces off moon because it's surprisingly bulky um I don't know. I probably would have just Torch Song there because it's not like Torkoal really does anything and you're stalling out sun turns and things of the sort. But uh, he probably wanted the kill so he could stay healthy, which is also fair uh, if he doesn't have a ghost move. Next, that Taurus is going to come in. And unfortunately, uh, this uh, Rocky Helmet in Tim Taurus is going to be a big, big issue. Um, as good as Moon is, maybe even like either a clear ambulant or a protective pad set could have been really solid to kind of avoid this chip. Because look at this. As scary as Moon is, you're in range of a cell rock now. Like... No advance or buts about it. You're also in range of the Glaive, which you kind of were in general. But, um, yeah, it's, it's it's looking a little tough right here. Now, good news is Moth is able to come in right here. And it's going to be able to click a button as he goes for the T-Spike. And, again, this really, really hurt me. This really, really hurt me. His poison resist right now is the Dirge. You're, um, you're under Sun, or his fire resist is even the Dirge. I think it is much more wild, worthwhile 
going for an attack right there and really trying to chip down this team. Even if it's just a fiery dance right there and making the hard wave and switching out, or just a sludge wave. You're breaking scale on this, or you're chipping the dirge round in a range where it has to go for a slack off, and you can potentially try and grab some offensive momentum back into your corner, right? By going for a T-Spike, yeah, you can poison that cow coming back in. Um, you can poison the Lycanroc and even the Glade and really limit its turns. I think you need to force a little bit more progress right here, if that makes any sense. Um, Bronzong's going to come out this next turn. Um, it's going to take a little bit of rocks as a DD comes out. And this is where things start looking really scary, man. Obviously, Zong is kind of here dedicated to check this thing. But we're losing our Terra option elsewhere, which, to be fair... Um, maybe if we were like Terra Ghost Mismag, that would be really bad. But it's Terra Electric, which I don't find to be particularly super useful right now. Um, so this defensive Terra kind of makes sense in this scenario. He's going to Fire Punch into this guy as he does just Ice Spinner, doing a bit of damage right here as a D-Dance is going to come out once again. Ice Spinner comes out, losing the 50-50 a little bit there on um, the sense that he finally did end up tearing. Obviously, though, if he ended up not tearing and you body press, you're in a really, really bad spot. Um, but even then, you just have to win that 150-50 when he's a dragon or not. E-Speed is actually going to be lived on 1%. By the Zong, and it's gonna clutch up and knock out that Dragonite. And again, we're up in Mons right here. We have some things very chipped. Tauros is chipped with a T spike up. Galate is chipped with a T spike and rocks up. Um, and even if you can like just get the item off this somehow, which you're not gonna be able to because this guy is just faster. Um, you know, this is really the only stopgap to you know potentially winning a little bit later on. Again, if we don't count that Lycan Rock, because at this point, what do we do about it when it comes in? We're gonna see the Roaring Moon come out. Again, he has a very free Tauros right here. There's not much stopping it at this point. It's going to get poisoned right here, which is nice. And a nice middle ground EQ comes out as it is going to chip it down immensely. And you're not going to take any more helmet damage. So I think that's definitely a smart click. He's not going to let the dirge die there. And even if he does, it's in two KO range and then your moth can come in and revenge it. Uh, but again, these rocks are looking pretty tough. He's going to go into the Torkoal and just basically sack it off right here as a Trailblaze comes out, which is very, very interesting. Um, and this forces in the Mismag, which again, isn't the worst thing in the world. Um, it doesn't really like you know kill you or anything like that um but we're gonna see the shadow ball pop and you think okay three three offensive matchup the dirge comes out which again really interesting i don't know if he was like you know just making sure he got damage on a more bulky miss mag and maybe one more rock switch and you know killed like h max hp or something like that he is going to torch song into the solar owner right here um as i believe we see a fiery dance and a sack into the glade Sludge Wave makes sense. It just still does a lot, and it's you know pretty strong in everything. Um, and then the Lycan Rock comes out, and unfortunately, that's the end. Um, so I think this game was kind of just a matter of one, maybe not having a lot for the Lycan Rock, which we can kind of look back at the match really quick and see if there's anything else we could have brought. But two, kind of recognizing that if we um, kind of recognizing my opponent's end game and their potential outs to win, opposed to just mine and tunneling on my ways of winning, right? His ways of winning were kind of overwhelming with his physical offense, I think. Um, with Glade, Lycanroc, and um, Dragonite. And then having things like Dirge really chip you down. Having things like Taurus really chip you down. Uh, getting out potential hazards with Sandy Shocks. Or just like Life Orb ripping through your physically defensive Pokemon. Um, that you kind of were forced to switch into it. Maybe it was a matter of not having a good Sandy Shock switch in. We can kind of look back at the matchup real quick. Hold on. I think it's definitely... Um worth revisiting because they want to just say like ah oh, you sacked your check you're dumb you know that's not um that's not really super productive right now as for other checks to the shocks maybe a spadef leafion but even then like that thing's getting super chip super fast it's not known for its spadef right like the shocks matchup was pretty bad maybe we could have brought in a spadef gastro um to check it but then again we're super super weak to that um, Lycan Rock, and there's not much on the bench that really happens to be there for Lycan Rock. I don't know. Um, this is a really tough one. This is a really tough one. Maybe a physically defensive Slitherwing could have done something as Lycan Rock. I'm not too sure on those calcs. I don't think it takes two, um, or even takes an Acel Rock into a Stone Edge for that matter, or a Psychic Fangs, or a Play Rough, which it very well could have potentially had, or something of the sort. So. Uh, it's just a tough one overall. I don't necessarily think that Oliver played bad in this one. I think it was just kind of a lack of like an end game awareness and like understanding like, okay, this is how I lose. This is how my opponent wins. And I need to make sure I'm not putting him in a position to do so. Really, those last like 10 turns were a formality. Um, as soon as that, like, as soon as those Pokemon took the chip they needed, like the Bronzong was like dead. Uh, the, the game was over. Lycanroc came in and clicked a Cell Rock three times. Um, and it's just how it is sometimes, unfortunately. But, uh... Yeah, I, I hope this was a good analysis. It's a little shorter than the last one, um, but there wasn't as much to talk about in this one. I feel like I feel like it really just was kind of that um, positioning into that Lycanroc in the end game. 
Uh, let me know what you guys thought. Again, go ahead and, um, you know, drop your replays in the description below. I'd love to look at more. We got 17 right now, so we got plenty to work with. I'm hoping to put out, like, one of these a week. Uh, they're a lot of fun. I really like, you know, nitpicking and analyzing. It's my favorite part about draft and, uh, you know, just competitive Pokemon in general is all the, you know, twists and turns that can happen in a battle that will, you know, change the outcome. You can play the same matchup 50 times. Not one of them will be the same game, which I think is really cool. And, you know, this is a cool one. So, yeah, again, thank you guys so much for watching. Drop a like. Enjoy. So, you know, see you in the next one. Later.